Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to our Thursday morning um, HIV Center Grand Rounds. Hope everyone's staying safe, warm, healthy. Um, those are getting vaccinated when they can. And when their, their number comes up, their name comes, their eligibility comes up. Um, but we hope you and your families are, are all doing well. Um, so I'm going to um, mention our two rounds in March. So on March 4th, we have Dr. Monica Rivera Mint from Fordham University talking on health disparities and neurocognition in the context of HIV. And then on March 18th, we have um, our two of our postdoctoral research fellows um, doing uh, presentations, the two of them in, on, on March 18th. First up will be Liad Timmons talking about sexual identity, sexual behavior, and pre exposure prophylaxis in Black cisgender sexual minority men the N2 cohort study in Chicago. And then second up will be Ofole Mbako, whose title of his talk is Black Lives with HIV Matter, Addressing Systemic Racism on the Journey to Sustained Undetectable Viral Load for Black MSM. So please join us for our, our March Grand Rounds, March 4th and March 18th. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our, our guest speaker today, um, someone I've known um, for a very long time and I'm well respected and uh, someone I look up to in, in the field and, and because of her research. Um, Laura M. Bogart, um, who is a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corpora Corporation and professor in the Party RAND Graduate School. She's a social psychologist with expertise in HIV inequities, including psychosocial and structural factors in HIV prevention and treatment and development and testing of HIV prevention and adherence interventions in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, particularly or in, mainly including Botswana, South Africa and Uganda. Much of her research focuses on intersectional stigma and discrimination and medical mistrust especially among Black, Afri African American, and Latinx individuals. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Laura, who's talking to us today on, and you can all see the title, Addressing Medical Mistrust and Strengthening Resilience to Intersectional Stigma Among Black and Latinx Sexual Minority Men. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here, Laura, and, over, and especially for you being um, three hours earlier on the West Coast. So we're, <laughs> we're privileged to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Bob, and, and I'm very excited to present you to you today, and thanks very much for this opportunity. Today I'm going to be talking about my individual level interventions on addressing medical mistrust and strengthening resilience to intersectional stigma and discrimination among Black and Latinx sexual minority men. While you're while you're just maneuvering there, I, I always I forgot to mention. So I think everyone knows the, the routine here. So you know, be on mute during the presentation. Um, there's a chat function. You can start to put your questions in there during the presentation, or just put in your name, and then you can unmute yourself and ask your questions yourself. And Stephen Lauren will be monitoring the Q and A at the end of um, Laura's talk. So back to you, Laura. <laughs> hey, thank you. So, so yeah, the slides I know are a little slow coming up, so I'll take a, um, I'll wait till they come up. So, so I want to start first with an analogy, because when I mentioned that I'm doing an individual level intervention, a lot of people, a lot of different audiences say, why are you focused on the individual and the people who are the victims of discrimination and telling them to change? You know, why are you focused on the perpetrators and the structures in society that need to change? And I think this is a very valid point, and I think both types of interventions are needed. So I think that we need to think about the individual level intervention, but have an eye towards the structural as well as we do that. So we use this burning building analogy to discuss this concept. So if a building is on fire, you don't leave the people in there and then put the fire out. You rescue the people, you put the fire out, and then you try to figure out why did the fire start in the first place so that we can figure out how to prevent such fires in the future. And that's what we're trying to do here, trying to help people individually to cope with discrimination and lead healthier lives towards wellness, and also keep an eye towards those parts of society that are leading to maintaining oppression. 
So I have here on this slide a very apt quote from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who wrote an op-ed in the LA Times last year, May of 2020, where he also used the burning building quote, um, building, burning building analogy. He talked about how racism in America is like dust in the air. And it seems invisible, even if you're choking on it until you let the sun in, and then you see it's everywhere. So he talks about how we have to stay vigilant. And that's something that we're doing in this intervention is building awareness about this racism in people's lives. So here, I'd like to talk a little bit about the background of my intervention work, um, the conceptual reasons for it and the prior research. So individuals can face stigma and discrimination from a number of intersectionalities. And here we have another analogy of a traffic circle and a person in the middle of a traffic circle um, standing there as a holistic person and all the paths leading to that person and that make up that whole. And it can be different kinds of identities or poverty or social status and all the kinds of intersectionalities that feed into that person. So I start with a biopsychosocial model that discrimination can affect health, health outcomes through two pathways. So one is the direct pathway, the physiological, that increases stress response and affects immune functioning and leads to a cumulative effect over time, a weathering on the system that can lead to lower survival rates. The other pathway that we're focused on here is the psychosocial or behavioral pathway and specifically how discrimination and stigma can lead to ineffective coping, which can include avoidance or escape through substance use or sexual behavior, for example, or self-blame and internalization of the stigma. It can also lead to a specific form of coping um, that I conceptualize as medical mistrust and that I'm gonna focus on more in the next few slides. So, so we know from empirical research um, um, that we've seen here that discrimination leads to mistrust and in turn affects health. And conceptually, we know historical injustices and ongoing structural and interpersonal discrimination lead to mistrust. This is where mistrust comes from. And, and so empirical research has shown that experiencing discrimination associated with higher mistrust. So for example, there have been studies of black men um, before and after 1972 in Macon County, Georgia. And in 1972, Macon County, Georgia is where the Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee was done. In 1972 is when the public disclosure took place of the study. We find that black men before and after 1972 who lived further, closer versus further to Macon County, Georgia had higher levels of medical mistrust after 1972. So people who live closer to where the study was done had higher levels after 1972, and in turn had lower healthcare utilization and also lower survival rates. So this shows how medical mistrust, um, known from a historical injustice from an unethical medical experiment, then led to medical mistrust with in turn affected health behaviors and outcomes. We've also seen studies um, where that tested mistrust as a mediator of the association between discrimination and health behaviors. So that, that people who experienced discrimination, um, two studies with, with people of color who were sexual minority men. So, so in these two studies, we found that mistrust was a mediator between experiencing discrimination and then health behaviors in these cases, longer time since medical exams, so delays as well as non-adherence to treatment. So uh, in my research, I characterize mistrust as a form of resilience and, and thinking about mistrust as a form of resilience because high levels of medical mistrust are seen as a justifiable and rational response to discrimination and systemic racism. So thought in terms of this conceptual model, mistrust is not necessarily harmful or something that we need to get rid of because it can offer a protective or adaptive survival mechanism in the face of oppression and can actually be a healthy functioning coping, functional coping mechanism when it empowers individuals for change when it's channeled effectively. So we don't necessarily want to talk about getting rid of mistrust, but rather addressing mistrust, talking about mistrust, and acknowledging mistrust so that people can then think about how mistrust might be affecting behaviors. 
So mistrust can spread and be maintained in social networks. So when people have been oppressed by the healthcare system and society in general, they may turn more to social network members for healthcare advice because social net network members understand the context of discrimination in healthcare and systemic racism, and then are seen as more credible for asking advice. And so in a study I did with Charles Drew University among black people living with HIV, we found that HIV treatment non-adherence was related to hearing HIV conspiracy beliefs, a form of medical mistrust from similar network members. So people who heard HIV conspiracy beliefs around, for example, HIV treatment is poison and beliefs such as that from people in their network who are of similar race, age, gender, and serostatus were less likely to adhere to treatment. Mistrust can also be reinforced at the structural level by formal and informal leaders. And, and the converse is true that trust can be reinforced at the structural level as well. So when formal leaders and informal leaders in, in one social network um, talk about mistrust beliefs, we're more likely to believe them. But when formal leaders, when it comes from the top, um, for example, elected officials, religious leaders who we trust talk about these beliefs, we're more likely to believe them. And it can be online, as we've seen a lot, especially during COVID, as well as in person. And a particularly striking example of this is from South Africa, where in the early 2000s, President Mbeki um, advanced conspiracy beliefs such as HIV doesn't cause AIDS or the treatment is harmful, or that HIV can be treated through alternative medicines like beetroot. And as a result, the government withheld treatment and and anal one analysis suggested that this led to 330,000 deaths and 35,000 babies being born with HIV from 2000 to 2005. So it's just an example of how leaders who advance mistrust can have real effects. So now I'd like to put this all together as a conceptual model that underpins my research. So um, as, as I've talked in the prior slides, structural and interpersonal, Intersectional stigma and discrimination can lead to a coping response, and that can be ineffective, such as avoidance or internalization or medical mistrust. And this can affect HIV and other health inequities. And as I've talked about, um, this coping response can be reinforced at the social level and the structural level. And what we're doing here with the intervention is intervening right here between interpersonal discrimination, structural and interpersonal stigma and discrimination, and the coping response. So this, so what I'm going to talk about today is a group level community based cognitive behavior therapy intervention to address individuals coping responses. And one thing what, that we're trying to do is increase the use of effective coping responses such as social support. So the goals of the intervention are to strengthen resilience resources and effective coping responses to intersectional stigma and discrimination, address medical mistrust, conceptualize as a coping response to discrimination, as I mentioned. And once people, um, we talk about the internalization of stigma and, and people address their internal coping resources, then we empower individuals to make change in their communities and go out and spread the word and tell others and try to make these um, structural changes. And the goals of the study have been, of the intervention have been different depending on the study. So we've looked at a variety of health outcomes and adapted the intervention for a variety of health outcomes related to HIV prevention and treatment, but also general preventive healthcare engagement. So we developed separate parallel culturally congruent interventions for black and Latinx sexual minority men. For black men, we developed still climbing. You can see the flyers for each of these on the left side of your screen. And still climbing is named after a line in a Langston Hughes poem, Mother to Son, about resilience in the face of hardship. Siempre seguiré, um, translated loosely as I will always continue. And it's based on this popular Spanish language song that's seen as a message of empowerment in Latinx gay communities. And both of these were named by community stakeholders and partners whom we, we were working with. So I wanna talk a little bit about how the intervention was developed with community partner and stakeholder engagement, because obviously I'm not from the communities. Um, 
for whom these interventions are being developed. So we had equal partnerships with people in these communities to learn what was needed for intervention and what did stakeholders want? What did stakeholders think was feasible? What did the clients of, of different organizations want in terms of what would be acceptable and what kind of intervention they needed? And so we did formative research using semi-structured interviews that we, we asked people, clients of organizations experiences with discrimination from intersectional identities and their coping responses. We also did research and formative interviews with people in different organizations and several of the organizations are listed here. These were all of the partners in the research in both Boston and LA. Um, and we asked people, you know, what intervention would be feasible? What, what do you need in your programming? What would fit within your programming? Because ultimately we want this to be something that could be sustained. So, and as I mentioned, as you know, I'm not from the community and I can't say what intervention needs to be done. So we needed to do this research to see what was happening. What, what were men's stories? What were the central concepts around coping and medical mistrust? that we could then use within the intervention and intervention manual. And an important facet of this intervention is we're not telling people this is how you should cope. What we're doing is saying we already know from our formative research that men have innate resilience resources for effective coping. We um, sometimes it's more developed than others. So for example, people talked about more well-developed coping mechanisms and resources for racism than for other identities. So, so what we decided is rather than telling people here are some ways you should cope, we would say, well, you already have them. You already have innate resilience resources, but let's talk about how to apply them to different situations, how to generalize depending on what discrimination experience you're having. We also found in the formative research that people had a real need for a safe, supportive space for their holistic self that they were saying, you know, there are places I can go to get support for my racial identity, but not my sexual orientation identity. So we heard things like that, that they really wanted one place they could go and talk to similar people. So the next slide shows some quotes from the men in the formative research that showed men's need for a safe, supportive space. And both of these quotes are about church, actually. So on the left, there's a quote from a black man living with HIV. Um, and what he says is he actually does go to church and he gets support there, but he recognizes that he can only get support for his racial identity there. Or he says at the end of the quote, there are people who try to limit me from getting those blessings, you know. And so he went on to talk about how he can't really express his sexual um, orientation identity or tell people about his HIV in this church, but he gets a lot of support there. The man on the right, a Latinx man living with HIV, um, said that, you know, he knows that other people get support from churches, but it's not for him because he doesn't want to go to a place where he feels like he's punished or afraid. And he needs a place where he feels fine, where he can express his holistic identity. So now I'm going to talk about how the intervention works. So the intervention content and structure. It's eight community-based group sessions, and as I mentioned, it uses CBT strategies led by a trained counselor and facilitator and a peer co-facilitator. And so we found um, in our formative research that people wanted both. They wanted someone who was trained as a mental health counselor, but also they wanted someone who was more of a peer who could be a part of the group and help to lead them and who shared all of their identities. So, so it's someone who is matched in the identities being discussed in the group. In the sessions, people learn the CBT model and how to conduct a behavioral analysis of their thoughts, emotions, and behaviors in response to stigma and discrimination. And we also um, felt it was key to enhance awareness of stigma and discrimination so that people could recognize when they were in a situation where they needed to think about how to apply the CBT model, for example, and adaptive ways to cope. We also talked to them about maintaining their life values and goals while they were coping. So for example, if someone tells us their life goal is to be healthy and to live a long life for their family or for themselves, um, and then they said, well, I don't trust the doctor, so I'm not, not going to healthcare at all. We talked to them about 
well, if you're not going to go to healthcare, but your goal is to lead a healthy life, you know, think about that discrepancy and what you might want to do about it. And then we told people it's really important not just to make changes in the session and practice in our sessions, but also to make changes in their real life and to go out, make those changes, and then report back. So we had take home activities where people could do this. And I'll go into those in detail in a moment. But first, I wanted to go through some of the session topics. So, so we always start with psychoeducation and we define the terms, the relevant terms, stigma, discrimination, intersectionality. We also talk about the health issue of focus, which I mentioned varies by the intervention group that we're doing, the different kinds of ways we've adapted it. And we also, um, for the health issue of focus, what we've started to do is bring in a healthcare provider to talk to the group. So for example, we have a group focused on PrEP and HIV prevention and testing. So for that group, we've had people come in to talk about um, who's an HIV counselor or a PrEP navigator. We also have a group that's focused on more holistic health issues and healthcare engagement. For that, we've had a mental health provider come in and talk and also a primary care provider come in and talk. And because it was recently, and um, there was a lot of discussion around the COVID-19 vaccine and asking questions. And, and what we do is we just ask the provider to come and say what they do and mostly have a Q&A so that people can ask, you know, what happens in a primary care appointment or, you know, or mental health appointment. And so that people can, can get their questions answered and then maybe more willing to engage with healthcare. So we talk about using the CBT model and identifying and overcoming barriers to effective coping. We also talk more specifically about three kinds of coping, medical mistrust and internalized stigma. Um, and we also talk about getting social support as a positive form, effective form of coping. And for the getting social support session, we also have a resource list that we put together on local places that they can get support, they can engage maybe local support groups or volunteer opportunities and ways that they might be able to get support for different pieces of their identity or for the whole of identity. So where they can find similar people, similar to our group. And then in our last session, we talk about structural discrimination. And now that people have been empowered, now, it, now if, they're, if they want to, they can take action. And we also have a resource list for that where we tell them about local social justice causes or things that they can get involved in, volunteer opportunities, for example, the local Black Lives Matter chapter and different things like that. So we see group process and cohesion as the mechanisms of change, um, as one of the mechanisms of change, because the group provides a safe space for men to support their holistic intersectional identities with similar others. So it builds their social support. And as I mentioned before, um, we, we knew from the formative research that people already have innate effective coping strategies and resilience resources. And what's important is that men share and model them for each other so that they can learn from each other rather than us teaching them. We also have bonding, which can be formally or in session. And when we're able to do these in person, we actually have a meal before the group, um, before the official group starts so that they can bond and they play music and bond and talk more informally and get to know each other. We also have informal unstructured time. So for example, now that we're doing more Zoom meetings, um, we leave the room open uh, after the group so that the men can talk to each other after the facilitator leaves. And this is something that's been requested by the group and we find that men really like doing that and getting to know each other. So we integrate intersectionality uh, by participation. Um, participants discuss how multiple interlocking identities comprise their holistic sense of self. And um, we also encourage them to process how stigma and discrimination affect the whole of their identity rather than the separate components. We also, as I mentioned, show them the CBT model. And this is a handout from the group so that they can see how their behaviors, thoughts, and emotions are all linked with each other and one affects the other. And I want to just um, show you a slide that shows what we're teaching with the CBT model. So there's an event and interpretation of it as discrimination, a discrimination event. 
and then there's a reaction. So prior to the group, men may have internalized these reactions. They may have a thought like, maybe I deserve to be treated like this. They might also have an emotion linked to that thought, such as shame, anger, fear, sadness. And they might have behaviors that might be ineffective coping, like displaying anger or concealing their identities and avoidance of people and places where they fear they might experience discrimination. So how the group changes this is, once again, there's an event, an interpretation. And then now with the group, they, they are more aware of these kinds of experiences and their reactions. So they say, well, this is one of those times I need to be careful about. And so their reaction now might be an externalizing thought rather than an internalizing thought. Like this is about them, not me. They might also have a different emotional response as a result and more self-compassion. And finally, they might have behaviors now that they've learned through the group, like getting social support, maybe even from group members and people they've met in the group. So now I'd like to talk about some of the actual activities we give to people in the group. So, so we start off on the very first session doing this identity pie activity. And in this activity, we ask them to express you know, who they are as a person through all of their identities and then introduce themselves to each other using this identity pie activity. And then throughout the group, we keep referring back to the identity pie. Like when we talk about coping, we talk again about, you know, go back to the identity pie, you know, where have you experienced discrimination and, um, and how has it affected you as a whole person? We also don't use the term intersectionality when we talk about their different identities. And we use the traffic circle analogy that I discussed before and talk about multiple identities. And as I mentioned, we give them take home activities to do each week, except for the last week. And, and what we like to do is build on them each week. So, so every week we ask them about a discrimination experience and to describe that discrimination experience and how it affected them and what identities it might have been based on. And we also say if they didn't experience anything um, recently, they can think about something they've been thinking about from the past. And this is the very first take home activity I have displayed here. So with this, we just ask them to describe the activity. But then later throughout every session, we build on that as they learn more about coping, then they describe their coping responses. As they learn more about, for example, vulnerability factors, like what, what kinds of factors might have affected their coping. For example, if they're in an unstable living situation or they didn't have enough food to eat or they didn't get enough sleep, how that might have affected their response the next day. So as I mentioned, we build on this initial description of discrimination. So for example, we ask them to do a chain analysis where they look at the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors during the experience as well as after the experience and then describe that. So they start to break down their experiences. So next, I just wanna briefly talk about the three different sets of studies that we've done around this intervention. So first we did pilot testing. And we randomized people um, and um, we did randomized pilot tests and for we randomized 76 HIV positive Latinx sexual minority men and that was done in LA and they were mostly of Mexican ethnicity. And we did also an, a pilot study in Boston with Fenway Health and Multicultural AIDS Coalition. And that was with 64 HIV positive black sexual minority men. And in LA, we work closely with BNSR Human Services. So then the randomized pilot tests, we did quantitative assessments at baseline and two follow-ups. We measured coping, medical mistrust through the HIV conspiracy belief scale, as well as internalized HIV stigma. And for Siempre Segure only, we did antiretroviral therapy adherence, and we used MEMSCAPS to do electronically monitored adherence to measure the number of doses taken out of the bottle each day where we could calculate the percentage of prescribed doses taken. 
We also did a self-report visual analog scale of past month adherence at each time point. And finally, we did qualitative interviews to assess the acceptability of the intervention. And so retention in the surveys was high over 80% in both studies. Attendance was okay for both interventions, so much better in the intervention with Latinx men than with black men, actually. Um, so we did have some issues with the retention. It's important to note that nearly all reasons for missed sessions or lack of retention were unrelated to the intervention or study. So, so usually with something like a scheduling conflict, like due to work or travel out of the country, which should happen frequently with um, the participants in LA, as well as transportation issues and getting to the sessions. We showed preliminary adherence effects um, uh, for the men in the Latinx um, intervention. And so as you can see here, the y-axis has the average electronically monitored adherence in terms of percentage of doses taken. And the x-axis has the length of time that we measured people in the study from zero months um, to seven months. And it also shows the intervention period, was, which was about from two months to five months. And as you can see here um, in our pilot, we had a medium effect on adherence. And you can see the black line, the intervention line, um, goes up gradually during the intervention period and then peaks after the intervention. The effect did dissipate um, several months after the intervention. And we found a similar effect for self-reported adherence. We also found preliminary coping effects. So um, decreased negative religious coping beliefs, like feeling punished and response, feeling punished by God in response to discrimination, decreased, um, decreased medical mistrust in the form of conspiracy beliefs, and decreased internalized HIV stigma. So these were found um, in Siempre Seguiré. For Stilclimin, we also found preliminary coping effects. So in terms of um, higher adaptive coping measured by the brief cope and Afrocultural coping inventory. So more active problem solving coping, coping through the use of humor and um, more self-protective or survival strategies, such as getting social support. So we found very high enthusiasm, high acceptability of the intervention, um, both interventions. So here's some quotes from our exit interviews. So, um, for example, one man says, you realize you're not the only one, you know how to deal with situations in the future. The man on the right um, said something that was a very common sentiment, that people wanted more sessions, more groups. They really wanted more. They felt that it wasn't enough. They bonded so much they wanted to keep meeting. And in some cases, we found that some men did informally meet after the groups ended. Among still climbing participants, we also found a lot of enthusiasm. So for example, the man on the left says, I'd recommend to all men, all black men living with HIV. And then he ends by saying, I'd recommend it to every person that's a minority. So we, we heard this a lot that, you know, everybody should go through this kind of intervention. It was very helpful. And a person on the right says, that, that he actually um, gained a lot from doing the homework. So I would take and learn what I use in the group as far as a coping response later. And then really that made him learn how to use what he was learning in the group external to the group. So just a brief note about the RCTs that are in process. So um, we have two RCTs and one is to increase HIV testing and PrEP use among Latinx sexual minority men of HIV negative or unknown serostatus. So it's focused on HIV prevention. The other one is more of a holistic wellness intervention, and it's not focused on any specific condition or disease. And so um, it's a serostatus neutral intervention. It's to increase prevention, preventive care engagement and receipt of evidence-based preventive care among black sexual minority men. Both of these started within the last two weeks. So, uh, so we've been very busy recently, but I don't have that much to present on them as a result. So for both of them, very similar designs, 300 participants, um, half intervention, half control in each, and surveys at baseline and at three time points post-intervention up until 12 months follow-up. 
and we're using both self-report and medical records for the health outcomes, as well as a urinalysis of PrEP adherence for the PrEP intervention. And I've already talked about some of the features that we added for the RCTs that weren't actually in the pilot. So we have this new Q&A with healthcare providers that I mentioned, um, where we have healthcare providers who are able to answer participants' questions about the health issues of focus. Um, and, and so we feel that this is a sustainable feature because we're doing this intervention in agencies and some of which are linked to um, different clinics and so we're able to get people to come in and give these talks. We also added resource lists for change, which I've mentioned. So for example, we give people a list of healthcare organizations in the um, local health care organizations that we feel can give some of the services that we've talked about in the group, as well as ways to enhance their social network and get social support, which I mentioned, as well as resources for a community and structural change in the very last session. So just, I couldn't end before talking about how we've adapted this intervention in the time of COVID and we did a virtual feasibility study. So we were actually funded to do these about a year ago, both of these interventions, but we couldn't get started right away because they're in-person interventions. And so we took a while to adapt the intervention for a virtual platform and conduct a pilot feasibility and acceptability study. So we, we know that virtual services like telehealth are safer in this time, can help to reach clients who live in remote areas, who can't travel in person, or whose schedules don't allow for travel time, for example, due to traffic. But we were concerned about doing this kind of a virtual intervention because we were worried it would widen inequities by leaving out people without sufficient internet connectivity and privacy. So what we did is we screened participants to see, was it feasible to do this kind of a study? Like, did they have own a device like a smartphone or tablet? Did they have access to Wi-Fi or a cell phone data plan? And did they have a private safe space or were they living in, for example, crowded living conditions where they couldn't do this kind of an intervention privately? We also added a lot of visuals. So we created animated stories of discrimination and movie clips and slides. And then we also accept acceptability through qualitative exit interviews. And we only, this is very small, we only did two pilot groups, one for each type of intervention. So preliminary results were we did find some issues with Wi-Fi and audio video or people who were not willing to use the camera or who didn't have a private space, even though when we screened them, they said they did. Um, for example, we did find someone who ended up his private space was driving in an Uber. And so we were worried that wasn't private when he had customers in the backseat. Um, we also had challenges with engagement and multitasking of participants. And so that affected group cohesion and retention. Um, we heard participants you know, making dinner or driving or a number of tasks in the background. We also found that the virtual space enabled some participants who couldn't attend to in person to participate. So some people we never would have reached were able to be reached. And some people really have preferred the virtual approach and found that it was easier than going somewhere in person where they couldn't necessarily do. So we may still offer this option post pandemic for some participants. But as I mentioned, there were some technical challenges. So for example, we found that we created all these beautiful PowerPoint slides, but when people only had a phone to do these sessions, a smartphone, they couldn't see the PowerPoint slides or they couldn't see all the videos that well. Um, they also, so they talked about that as a distraction or um, we had some issues with the audio or the video not working, you know, as we've all had on Zoom and on these virtual platforms. And and another participant just said it was just so hard to sit in front of a computer during the sessions. We did find still consistent with our other formative research that participants actually did like the intervention a lot. They said they learned a lot, new methods on how to act or react to things related to discrimination and hearing other people's opinions. Um, both of these participants here in the quotes you know, talked about how hearing other people's opinions and stories was so helpful. And that is one of the main points why we have a group intervention. 
So just a bit on the conclusion. So the intervention shows promise. It's feasible and acceptable. I've shown you some preliminary effects. And it can be sustained by trained counselors in a community-based support group structure. So, so our in-progress RCTs, we're hoping will provide effectiveness data on, on new health outcomes, and we're also doing a cost effectiveness analysis. But clearly more work is needed. And we have had some challenges. One is that we've had challenges identifying and retaining clinically trained facilitators. And so we've been talking about you know, how this might be sustained in the future. It may be that peer facilitator support groups is the best way to go. And we need to think about simplifying the intervention for implementation in the future. We also, as I talked about on one of my very first slides, individual level interventions are insufficient. So we can, in our intervention, empower participants for change, provide resources and support to be change agents, but clearly complementary interventions are needed to assess structural discrimination, to address structural discrimination. So now I just um, like to mention a bunch of the references that, um, on which all of this work is based and on this presentation is based. And just the acknowledgments of the wonderful um, funders, partners, and collaborators throughout this um, long research period. But thank you. Thank you, Laura, for this uh, presentation and sharing this really critical work with us today. Um, just a reminder for everyone, uh, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask now, or you can enter your name and or question in the chat. Karen, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure, I'm struggling with my bandwidth today. Okay. So um, my question in the chat is really just about where you um, would put mental health here. Like, are you thinking of having a mental health condition as an identity or an aspect of social status? I mean, not that they're mutually exclusive. Um, would they be viewed maybe as ineffective coping? I was just thinking about your traffic circle at the beginning and where you would put mental health and substance use there as they intersect with the whole person? Well, thanks. That's a really good question. What we do with the traffic circle and the men and their identities is we let them determine that. So some men do talk about substance use as part of their identity or a mental health condition. And so it's not, we don't tell them or prescribe anything. We just say, you know, how do you see yourself as a person? What do you want to talk about in this intervention? Thank you, Laura. This is uh, very exciting and very interesting. Um, I was wondering whether you can say something about the quality of the exercises that people uh, were doing at home, um, because I, I can imagine that they're complicated. And having seen things coming back from people, I was wondering, um, do, in a way, do they get it? It's because it's in our language, basically, what you want them to do. So I'm curious to hear if you can say something about that. Well, really good question, because it is something we've talked about a lot. And, you know, how do we best have people practice outside of the groups? So, so yes, yeah, sometimes the quality is really good. Sometimes people don't do it at first. But when we talk about it in the groups and they see other people do it and they see how much other people are learning, they start to do it. And and a lot of times in our exit interviews, what we found is people have said, yeah, I didn't take it seriously at first. I didn't do it at first, but then I realized how important it is to actually do this, to be able to participate in the group. And so they started to do it more. Um, some people may not want to write it down. So we've even told people, you know, if, if, it, if writing down something isn't your thing, you know, just think about this so that you can share something in the group. So we try to be flexible, but we also tell them they need to do it. You know, they need to do it to be able to progress in the group and to be able to learn from the group, whatever way they can do it. That's, that's very interesting to hear. <laughs> Laura, we have a request to um, view your references if possible. Yes. And in the meantime, we have another question um, from Brian Kuttner. Brian says, fabulous presentation, thank you. 
What ideas have your participants and team considered for extending the intervention as the participants requested? I'm wondering if the idea is to increase the number of sessions or to extend the presumed mechanisms of action in some other format that's less intensive but potentially still keeps the intervention alive for longer. Thank you. A good question that that we have struggled with because people ask for more sessions, but they don't always want to attend more sessions. So that's so so we decided we couldn't extend it with more sessions because even though people want more, they're just not able to come to more. Uh, we have been thinking about, is there another format we could do for future dissemination? For example, um, a series of workshops over the weekend or something like that. Uh, we find that now the way that we're doing it is the best way to do it after a lot of different um, trial and error. But we also know that it's very hard to, you know, to sustain something over long term. What we're thinking about is with if this actually could fit within a community based support group structure, it would be more of an ongoing drop in group that people would have access to every week if they wanted it, but they won't have to go to every single week of it and they would be able to still get all of the material and talk through all of the issues. So in the future, it might be sustained more as something like that that's just always available and that people can attend for a year if they want or not. So, so again, it's something we're still struggling with and thinking about. Thanks, Laura. Any other questions? Stephen, I have another question. This is Theo again. Uh, Laura, you, you work in the US and you work in Uganda and other places in the world. And I was wondering if you can say something about uh, whether this intervention is uh, specific to the United States or whether you feel like, no, this could work everywhere. Because there are different cultures in, and different ways of thinking about community and, and individuality. Yes. I Thank you. That's that's a good question because I know I've talked actually with people in Botswana who've been very interested in this intervention and thought about you know, how we could apply it there and think about different kinds of identities and different kinds of stigma that people experience. I think it can be applicable, but I do take your point about the individuality and that may be something that's different. But I do think um, actually, I, I do, um, there is actually a study going on that I'm not that involved with, but that adapting this intervention for Myanmar. So I think that there are other ways that we can see as it's being adapted in other places and see whether it's applicable or not. I think the basic awareness of being aware of discrimination, being aware of how it affects you is something that can be transferred throughout, but it may need to be adapted very differently in other cases. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah, this is Bob. Um, hi, Laura. This is really interesting. Um, it, it's my question is not well formulated, but you know, you started off and ta and and you know talked a lot about the whole medical mistrust and the history, and you know, particularly in this country. Um, I'm just wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit, say a little bit more about how that played out um, in the groups or what you've, you know, what you've observed about that and also the fact that some of this is being done in medical care settings and, and just the whole, just say a little bit more about the medical mistrust issue and how that sort of played out in this intervention. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a good question. I th it plays out differently. Sometimes every time we do it, because there are different issues that people want to discuss related to mistrust. So, for example, now it's um, people are discussing more around COVID-19. And um, in the Latinx groups, we're also finding that people are, are talking about medical mistrust in the context of immigration and and discrimination against immigrants and, and accessing health care. So we find that everybody has a story to tell, but it's different depending on the context that we're in, in the, as a country, as well as the identities that people have that are being discriminated against. But 
but also we found that you know, we, when we talk more about medical mistrust, we ask people to share instances of, of discrimination in healthcare and how it's affected them. And we have found that a, lo a lot of people in the groups you know, aren't talking as much about discrimination specifically in healthcare or related to a health condition. What they're talking about is discrimination in the larger society in general and how that might affect their decision to engage with an institution in the US such as healthcare. So, so we've um, refined our discussion of mistrust around what we've learned from these groups. Thank you, yeah. Really important, interesting, thanks. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I have a question of internalized stigma uh, of homosexual identity, especially in religion. Uh, what are the best techniques to deal with that? Do you have any uh, model of the process or mechanisms that are involved in successful outcomes? So in terms of, um, thank you, in, in terms of dealing with internalized stigma more around sexual minority identity. Um, so we have a session devoted to internalized stigma and we talk about different stories that people have had and why they might internalize it and thinking about you know, um, what they are, is it because they believe the stereotype about their group and, and is this a thought that they're having? And so we talk about how thoughts, you know, don't necessarily have to be true, and it's something that they they might have that thought, but they can think about things differently. They don't necessarily have to buy into that cultural stereotype around their group, and this is where we introduce a lot about self compassion and thinking through how they could have more compassion for themselves and not internalize these negative stereotypes. So we found that this has been effective in people coming to realizations around this issue. Well, thank thank you. you. Laura, I have, a, I have a question about your intervention with the, with the black man. You sure. said that the outcome there is not specific, or you said that there are many outcomes in the way. How did you get this through the study section? Because <laughs> We want to know prevented infections or increase in testing. So what, what, kind, what kind of outcome did you present in your application? Thanks. It's a good question that we struggled with because what we were hearing from the men in the formative research in the pilot is that they didn't want another HIV related intervention, that they wanted to be treated as a holistic person and all of, and, and all of their wellness and health issues. So, so we did struggle with, well, what, how could we get this funded? And it ended up being funded through NIMHD and the health disparities study section. So what we were able to do is propose that we would be looking at um, basically whether they receive preventive health care for a variety of health conditions for, that would be appropriate for them, whether it was evidence-based. So whether we were getting them to access primary care and then whether they received the care that they needed um, appropriate to their age or, or other conditions. I see, that's mm -hmm. smart. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also, um, we heard from the organizations we work with too, that, that they would like to open up this group to everybody. So, so when we're focused on one condition or only one group of people is able to access the intervention, it's not as sustainable. So we also heard that as well. Would that imply, Laura, that you could have mixed groups of a black, white, Latinx, or do you feel like, no, it's critical for this intervention that we're dealing with one ethnicity, even though whatever that is, one ethnicity? That's a good question. We have heard from people in the groups that the one ethnicity was was very important so that people could get a safe space for their race or ethnicity and the discrimination there. And that's a large part of the group is talking about that kind of discrimination, racial discrimination. And that would probably not happen if you put people together or it's less likely to happen. Yes, yes, as a safe space. <laughs> 
Hi, I don't have a, a great connection today, but this is Phil Kornisky. Can you can you all hear? Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. I was just um, considering uh, either with the technical aspects or the intervention itself. I know it wasn't necessarily a, a variable of focus, but thinking about um, you talked a little bit about age and I wondered if, you know, you had enough representation from different age groups to see um, perhaps different experiences of discrimination or ability to access or anything you might be able to comment on, on thinking about like younger adults versus older. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. It has been harder admittedly to get younger adults involved in these groups. And we've tried different mechanisms going through different ways to recruit. And so we have gotten some younger people, but not as many as we would like. Um, one thing when we did the formative research is we asked, you know, would you prefer to be in a group um, of your same age or, you know, so that we thought about maybe having one group that was just younger people and talking about different issues. And we found that people really wanted a mixed age group and they, they wanted both younger and older because they felt they could learn from each other in different ways. They could learn maybe from the older men's experiences, but the older men could learn from what the younger men were experiencing currently. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I've got another question. Um, I know that uh, you did a like a really great uh, job of explaining why you're intervening at the individual level. And um, I'm interested in intervening at the provider level and the healthcare system level. And I just wonder if there are anything, if there's anything that you learned through the process of all these pilots and um, and studies uh, about implications for intervening within the healthcare setting itself or during healthcare interactions themselves. Yes, um, thank you, absolutely, because that's also. Um... We're going to be starting up a new line of research with provider interventions and addressing these kinds of issues such as intersectional stigma and medical mistrust and you know, the primary things we've learned and how we approach these issues is, is acknowledgement of, of the history of discrimination of what people have gone through and having and acknowledging that maybe somebody doesn't want to take their medications. Um, the reasons why that might be and talking through them and using that more motivational interviewing style of, of seeing what the reasons are that the patient has and talking through them rather than saying you must take medications or you must do this. So I think uh, the same way our facilitators talk with clients and the intervention would be the same way we would talk about acknowledging and using a more motivational interviewing style around these issues acknowledging mistrust and acknowledging why that might be an issue and having the patient make the decision. Thank you. That's really excellent. I, um, this just makes me think about, uh, you know, there are the, the sort of the micro tools, micro skills of motivational interviewing, but there's also the spirit of it. And it sounds almost like what you're doing is trying to intervene with providers to help them uh, be able to practice the spirit of MI with the acknowledgement that medical mistrust is uh, a normal reaction to have in the context of discrimination, so that then they can practice those micro skills uh, with more, you know, more collaboratively, more evocatively, more respectfully. Yes, absolutely. Very well said. Thank you for your presentation. This has been really fabulous. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, um, I will turn it over to Bob. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Laura. This, is, this really was interesting and, and really such an important line of research, as I said at the outset, that I've, I've followed you over the years and um, you really built up a, a nice portfolio in, in this domain. And, you know, important and timely, particularly, I mean, unfortunately, particularly in the times we're living in. 
and what's happening in the larger society. So I'm um, so thank you for bringing this to us. And um, I want to just remind everyone again of our March um, March rounds on March 4th and March 18th. I'm not going to repeat all the details which I announced earlier, but just keep those dates in mind. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. And everyone be well, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, have a good day. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. This is really great and great discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Laura. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Steve. Bye.